And who knows out of Loveless? That's, that's awesome. And I hope to, um, if you don't know her, uh, get to introduce her to you. And if you do know her, get to tell a story about her, which maybe you don't know already, that she's the first functional programmer. Um, so, first of all, thank you uh, for coming here. And thank you, organizers, for organizing this event and inviting me. And also, thank you, sponsors, because without sponsors, this, this conference wouldn't be. Um, so, if you have at all time, um, go to their booths or websites and check them out because they're awesome because they make this conference possible. Um, I'm not that famous, although the, the person who handed out my lanyard uh, recognized me. Um, so, my name is Daan van Berkel. Uh, I work for a company, uh, Info Support, in the Netherlands, which I'm, where I'm from. Uh, and also, I would like to thank them because they paid for my trip and stay here. Uh, so, thank you, Info Support. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that can with this handle. And if you want to see the work uh, I do uh, when I'm having fun, um, you can go to GitHub uh, on this uh, handle as well. So the talks that went before me, at least, rang true to me because they spoke of joy. Uh, and I experienced joy while coding. Uh, and because of that, I, I would like to share that with everybody. So I'm also organizing a conference, of, or co-organizing a conference in the Netherlands, which you may be interested in. It's Joy of Coding. Um, it's, it's, well, 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 some of you will be there as well, I know for, for a fact. Um, but if you want to enjoy sharing your love of coding with other developers, um, check out Joy of Coding. It's the 29th of May of this year. So I will end the shameless plug of myself and the conference I'm organizing. Uh, and we'll start with the talk with the question, why? Why do I want to give this talk? And um, one of the reasons uh, is actually uh, an emotional, like Gareth talked about this morning. Um, I think there's a, a great injustice done to our, our service, our, our work. Because if you look around you in this large room, um, there are very few women. And that's a shame. Because who, who loves coding? <coughs> everybody. And do you think that everybody could appreciate coding if they came, came to learn? Yes, I think so. And I don't see any reason why women couldn't enjoy coding as well. And for the fact, well, 50% of the children born on this earth are, are women. So where are they? So this, this question, why would I give this talk, is actually, I, I want to talk about emancipation. I want to talk about um, setting things right, because I think they're wrong in the world. Um, and I don't have the key to um, keeping women in, in tech and getting them there, getting there. But I think that one particular point is the perception. How do we perceive women? And, and again, this is a, an emotional talk for me. I have a little daughter, actually I have two. The oldest, she loves cars, like the animation movie. Uh, and she, she really wanted to have a backpack uh, with, the, with the car's logo. So obviously I, I gave it to her. And she went to the playground and one of the neighborhood kids, a girl a little bit older than she is, uh, came up to me and asked me, is she a boy or a girl? And I said, why do you ask me this? Well, she wears a, a car's uh, bag and that's for boys. And, and that's really sad, isn't it? Like this little girl, I can't blame her for having this stereotypical view of, of what boys and girls should or should not be doing. Um, I can't even blame our parents, but I can't blame the society. So I think our society we are living nowadays has a, a twisted view of what women can or cannot do and what men should or shouldn't do. Um, and one, one thing that I think would change that is the perception, how we perceive each other. So let's start with the beginning of our of our well, work, of our community, is like the first computer. And a lot of you might think that the first computer um, was built during uh, the Second World War to crack the Enigma. Uh, but it's not. It's actually a century earlier, someone thought up a computer of sorts, uh, and Ada Lovelace played a role. So with this talk, I would like to 
convey my unsung heroes of computer science, uh, namely, for starters, Ada Lovelace. Because I think, and I hope after this talk you will agree with me, that not only is she the first programmer, not only is she the first functional programmer, but she's also the first computer scientist and visionary. Um, so let's see how, how it pans out. If at all during this talk you have questions, I tried to raise my attention and I hope to incorporate them in this session because um, I, can, I can fill the, the entire length, but it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on this subject as well. So who knows who Adelow's father was? Lord Byron. Lord Byron, yes. So this man, um, who was obviously a, a great uh, writer and great poet, uh, also experienced wild bouts of, of emotional depression. And um, his wife, the, the, the mother of Adel Lovelace, uh, of the many wives he had, um, thought that the experience of the Lord um, in Adel Lovelace's lives um, would be detrimental. So she thought, like, what would, would be the most emotionless study to send Adel Lovelace off? That would be mathematics. So the Garrick's talk talked about um, emotions as well, and he he set it apart from mathematics. I'm, I'm a student of mathematics myself, um, and that, that hurt it a bit. So, like, mathematics can be emotional as well for me. Uh, and again, thinking that studying mathematics doesn't make you a depressionist, um, or will prevent you from wild mood swings, doesn't allow you for the fact that a lot of mathematicians went crazy and had severe depression. So, that move wouldn't be very wise, um, but nonetheless, it made Ada Lovelace a mathematician. And that's one of the, f the most important parts that she played while meeting this man. So, you probably can all guess who this is. Do you know who this is? Charles Babbage. It's Charles Babbage, indeed. Um, so, Charles Babbage plays a, a formative role in Ada Lovelace's work because he invented several machines uh, uh, among one, the analytic engine, which will be the, the precursor of the computer. Um, and you can call it a computer, at last it was never built. Um, and this man, it, it's worth to look into him a little bit more. So, Charles Babbage was a, was a wealthy man. Because he was wealthy, he had the opportunity to, well, do the things he liked. So, he, he studied mathematics, he hung out with great minds, like Ada Lovelace, uh, but also Herschel, uh, and, and some contemporaries. He traveled a lot. He went to, um, to France. He, he's originally from uh, the UK. Um, and uh, went to Italy to just discuss things he was interested in. And one thing he was interested in uh, was this. Do you know what this is a picture of? It's a picture of the world, yes. But why are there different colors in this picture? That's absolutely correct. So, the correct answer is the white countries on this map are the countries that Great Britain didn't invade or um, colonize. So, if you see this picture, you can really feel literally where the expression the sun will never set in the British Empire come from. Because, quite frankly, the British Empire was, was the entire world. And so, if you want to rule this world, you have to travel around a lot. You have to take the boat, um, you have to sail to foreign countries, or actually the same country and only a different continent. Um, and because of that, you need to have great skills. You need to have accurate clocks to keep track of where you are. And you need to um, have accurate maps of the world so you can plot out your trajectory. But you also have to need math skills. And this is where Charles Babbage, um, um, hobby came from. He knew that for navigational skills to travel the world, you need mathematics. So how does that pan out? So you need logarithms to do navigation. Does anybody know why? Great. It's something I can tell you then. So first of all, what is the logarithm? Um, well, the logarithm of a um, power is just the exponent which you raise the power to. <coughs> so that's a function. Uh, it's, it's a 
bit of a flaky definition, but bear with me. Um, but you can glean some information from this uh, looking at what exponentiation does. So let's look at a number, a, that's fixed, and we uh, raise it to a certain other numbers, m and n. And if you multiply these numbers, you get the following result, which is interesting. Because it relates to concept, not namely multiplication and addition. And for one, I think multiplication is hard. I can do it very well. Uh, if you give me time, I can do it with pen and paper. But addition is easier, and uh, the mathematics is on my side. If you look at the algorithm and the, and the complexity of, of the different algorithms to execute uh, addition and multiplication, addition is, uh, uh, runs in linear time uh, to the number of digits. Uh, and multiplication, the naive ways, um, runs in uh, n squared. Uh, you can do it a little bit better. You have to do, work really hard. So, if you cast these expressions, these mathematical formulas, uh, if you like, in the terms of logarithms, you see that if you take the logarithm of a product, you end up taking the logarithms of its sum. And this is great, because now we can do these, these complicate, complicated uh, multiplications and transform them in the easy uh, additions. But there's one catch. You need a logarithmic table for that. Um, does everybody know what a logarithmic table is? Yes, I'm old enough. Yeah. You're old enough, yes. That's exactly <laughs> the right point. So for those who aren't old enough, I unfortunately wasn't old enough to experience them really. This is a logarithmic table. So uh, it's a table of sorts. Uh, on, the, on the left side, there are your entry numbers and the increment. And on the right side, there's the, the evaluation of the function the log of that number. Um, so how does this work? If you want to find out what the log of, for example, 23 is, you go down the list until you find your input, and you, you go to the right and find the answer. And this works with different numbers. And if you know the composition rules, um, you can take two different numbers. That's really a bit of interesting. Yes. You can take a different number, for example, uh, 51, uh, you go down the different list where your entry is and you look up the logarithm. And if you've done that, you can do the inverse. So you add up the logarithms, and because you know the multiplication rules change into addition rules for logarithms, you can take the difference of the, the, the sum of those two and find out uh, and work in the reverse way. So uh, if again you want to look at this um, number, like a number of this, and you find it inside of the table on the right side you know what the exponent should be of the, of the power. Is this clear? Yes, great. So this is the basis of a lot of calculations. Um, if you don't know logarithmic tables, you probably even don't know the slide rule. And the slide rule is a calculator before the electronic calculator was invented. It was the workhorse of every engineer. Everyone had one or even multiple. And it worked alongside the similar ways. You have have a long arithmetic skill along the axis, and you shift, and that's the process of addition to figure out multiplication. So, logarithmic tables were essential. It, easy, it eased up a lot of work for an engineer. Just multiplication became additions. So, logarithmic, it's a hard word. These tables were very important. So, Charles Babbage had as a pastime uh, uh, set out to ask calculators, which were human, at the day, it was human, uh, asked them, could you give me a logarithmic table? Give me, give me such a table. And the calculator didn't she went to work, uh, provided use tables. But again, it's, it's human work. And what humans can do properly is work out a repetitive task without faults. So these tables have mistakes, obviously. So Charles Babbage, he, he was a bright man, so he asked two different, or rather multiple different persons, calculators, give me such a table. He handed the, he, when he got the results back, he would cross-check them with his friends. So I can't imagine how great these evenings would be, just sitting with Charles Babbage and just going down this table, and calling out numbers and checking them. But this is what he did, and um, he always found mistakes. And that's, that's very bad. If you can imagine that you set out to sail to uh, a different country, and you <coughs> miss with your calculations because the table is wrong, by one degree, at the end of your trip, you're going to end up uh, at, a, at a different place altogether. 
So this, that's very bad. So this man had an idea. So let's make a machine to calculate the logarithm for me. That was his idea. So then he stumbles on a problem, a problem, how do you calculate the logarithm? Does anybody know? Taylor series? Sorry? Taylor series? Yes, that's a good answer. Um, but if you don't know what a Taylor series is, it doesn't help you very much. So um, one of the techniques uh, is built on uh, finite differences. So uh, if you look at these numbers, what do you see? What do you feel about these numbers? Square. <laughs> <laughs> They're square. So this is, this is a series of squares. And does anything is remarkable about the squares? Differences. The differences, yes. Uh, so if you look at the differences, um, they form a, a different sequence. And these differences are, are regular themselves. So I could ask the same question. What is, what is interesting about this sequence of differences? It's linear. It's linear, yes. Their differences itself are just constants. And this is an interesting fact, and this is not a curiosity. Um, if you take any polynomial of whatever degree and take the series, just increment the, well, the, the value and, and look at the, uh, the result, and take difference of that, you eventually will end up with a, the constant stream of numbers. So this is interesting. If we have a polynomial that could represent a logarithm, then we could take differences of these values and end up with a, with a stream of constant numbers. And this thought occurred to Charles Babbage. Well, what if we could reverse this process? If we could start with all these simple numbers, these twos, and add them to three and iteratively work that out, we could eventually calculate a certain polynomial automatically. And that's the great idea of, of Charles Babbage. So not alone was Charles Babbage um, a wealthy man. He was also influential. He, he rubbed shoulders with the best of, as, of his time. So he went to his government and said, look, we have this great empire. Um, it's very fast. You have to travel it. So you have to do nav navigations. And for that, you need logarithmic tables. Uh, I can make these tables for a fraction of the time, um, but I need some money. Uh, so th the government, with some help of his friends, procured him a large sum of money so he could build a machine. Um, and that machine, which he envisioned, was the difference engine. And that the difference engine was actually based on uh, a contemporary of, of him. He, he took the idea that was already present. Does anybody know what this is, actually? It's a loom, yes. So uh, it's actually a Jacquard loom. A Jacquard loom is a loom which is operated by punch cards, also a relic of a different comp computer age. Um, but if you know how to, <coughs> to make tapestries, it's, it's a very hard process. So you, there's running threads through this machine, and by pulling on levers, you, you change the, the configuration of these and you um, shuttle a, a shuttle between the threads, uh, and that makes a tapestry. And um, Jacquard thought, well, this, this process is very repetitive. It's very easy to make a mistake because um, the entire weave of the tapestry uh, is built up of running a, a shuttle through back and forth, uh, which is very error prone. So Jacquard thought, well, maybe if you could automate this task, um, it will be better. We can go faster. So this is the industrial age. Uh, so he built this. And, and Charles Babbage knew of this machine. And he thought, well, if I can weave stuff, I can certainly do calculations. So this is his idea. And, he set out to build the difference engine. This is the, an image of the difference engine. And what this difference engine could do was his, was, was his vision is to do the difference method we saw earlier. So start with a certain number, um, add it to another number to get the next number, and use that in a stepwise fashion to calculate tables. So this machine, um, I, I haven't seen it in, in real life, but it's, you, can, you can go to a museum in London uh, and you, you can find it there. This machine was never built in the time that Charles Babbage lived. He tried to build it, but he got sidetracked uh, because while you had this enormous amount of money, you gathered around a lot of expert engineers 
and, and those he sent those engineers to work to, to create this machine. And, and this machine is really intricate. So this is a detail of, of the difference engine. And you see a, a column of numbers. It's not very hard to read, but every cylinder, every horizontal section, represents the number 0 to 9. And those numbers which actually um, read off of the, of the calculations the different engine makes. So, so Charles Babbage set out to, to create this machine, um, but he had a different idea. So he, got, he, got, he, he took a side project with him, and he thought, well, it's great we can build the difference engine now, but let's build, build a better machine that can do more than only differences. And he, and he thought of the analytic engine, and this is the, the analytic engine. So I mentioned before that Charles Babbage was a wealthy man, and he, he seemed to throw fabulous party, parties if you didn't have to read the logarithmic tables. Um, and he showed different persons prototypes of this machine, the analytic engine. Uh, and one of those persons was Ada Lovelace. So she's the heroine of the story. Um, she was a mathematician at the time. Um, she, she came from a, from, well, a wealthy family. Uh, she was invited to parties like this, and she said, well, this is awesome. I want to work with this man. I want to take his ideas and, and, and figure out how this works. So um, I think that if you can reflect on why she was motivated to doing that, she likes his emotions. It was really um, uh, the visceral reaction to the ideas that Charles Babbage presented. So how would that work out? is the question we are going to answer now. So before that, we have to look at numbers. So here's the number again that we typed in. We can choose a different number if you like. Um, does anybody have a favorite number? Uh, 42. 42. <laughs> so yeah, I, I should change it then to 42, but I can do it in this <coughs> position here. So we'll, we'll, we'll take 42 in a later moment. So, Mathematicians are a strange lot. They, they think about things that aren't real, actually. So they think about numbers a lot. But what are numbers, actually? And is this a number on the screen? That's a good question. I, I think it's not. It's actually a representation of a number. But it took me a while to get the relation. So because I'm slow, and you're probably not, I'm going to walk you by the, the actual representation that is made. And the, Reputation of this number is actually, um, if I have my focus back, yes, it's actually, it's a number, well, how we read it down is like the, the 5 in that position means 5 times 10, and the 1 in that position means 1 times 1. And why are these numbers 10 and 1 important? Well, they're actually the powers of 10 to the power of index 1. So, this is dull again. I, I'm, I'm probably boring you, but you could use another different, a different representation like this. Um, so again, it's the same number, only it's represented differently. And now we can see a different favorite number of yours, I mean 42, and how this changes. Um, and that doesn't really surprise you. So this is also one of the ideas of Jacquard, to use punch, punch cards, just uh, car, cartoon cards, uh, punch in, holes in them to represent numbers, uh, or in, in Jacquard's case, represent uh, weave patterns. So if you look at this, how can you improve on that? You can't improve on this. So this is the the ultimate step in computation, or? Binary. Binary, yes. We, we t take a particular representation, we take a base 10 representation of these numbers. And that, that means that we can use up to, we, we need to use 10 rows to represent different numbers. Um, but there are different bases. B binary is a different base, which only needs two digits. So we, we only need two rows to represent one number. Sorry? The, the, the suggestion here is you only need one row. Why, why is that? Yes, the suggestion is if you punch a hole or not, that's already giving you information if there should be 
a, a one or a zero. So yes, if you went, go to in binary, then this will be even better um, to, to convey information. So I'm not going to tell you that Charles Babbage did this, because he didn't. When he set out to create um, the analytic engine, he set out to create number cards of the former kind with more digits, uh, but sorry, with 10 digits, but with more uh, indicates. So he could represent 50 decimal places. Uh, it was Ada Lovelace who, who suggested in, in her notes that you can improve on this by using binary. So I want to take some time to look at this picture with you. Um, does anybody recognize this? <coughs> it's a fractal. That's an interesting question. I don't think it is. But, um, it's, it's kind of a fractal. I can, I can read that. So this is the analytic engine <coughs> that Charles Babbage uh, thought up. And this machine, I will, I will detail some of the important parts, uh, Re easily resembles a modern-day architecture. So, this, this central place here, that's called the mill. And all these fractal parts around it uh, are machinery to do different kinds of calculations. So then there's uh, these, these variables here. They're actually variables. These are the cylinders you, you saw earlier, um, taken from the difference engines, and represent numbers that are served as inputs to various operations. Um, and this rack, which is mentioned here, um, is a means to transfer, transfer information from these numbers into the mill to do different calculations. So this was the design that Charles Babbage came up with. Um, make a machine to represent numbers, um, make a machine that can do uh, basic operations. You have to think about addition and multiplication, division, subtraction, um, and certain other combination of operations that we'll talk about in a little while, um, have a means of transferring these uh, kinds of uh, numbers stored in those cylinders um, and place them into the mill and operate on them. This was his idea. Who knows how a modern computer works? Sorry? Um, at the level of chips, and if you want to go further at the level of the NANDs, you, you know the answer? ALUs, the NANDs, combination of NANDs, NANDs. NANDs. you can build a computer based only on NANDs. Yes. So and there actually, there's a, a great yeah. book called, um, I, I forgot what it's called, that, that just do, does this thing. It takes a NAND, which is an, uh, a logic gate, um, and uh, it simulates it, but you can build up an actual computer, well, actually a virtual computer, but a computer that actually computes things um, by building up logic gates with NANDs. Um, but that's, that's a too low level for it. So at a, a bit higher level are chips, and these chips are functions. And well, computers have uh, a CPU, central processing unit, which is like something like the MIP. And computers have memory, which is something like these variables. And there's a bus in the, in the computer, which will well, change information in the system. So basically, Charles Babbage dreamt up a modern computer a century before its time, which is awesome, I think. He did do something strange, though. So there were various numbers of cards. You can see them in this picture here. There's a representation of the number cards. Uh, this is the control cards, and the operation cards are a bit chopped off. Um, and these are he envisioned that these were the punch cards needed to operate this machine. He needed three different <coughs> types of punch cards. Um, one was for the numbers. You can store these punch cards in a reader, and that would transfer the numbers into these columns of representations. Um, that's fairly easy to comprehend. Then there were the variable cards. So these variable cards, um, or bus cards, as we call them now, tell you that, okay, I want to transform Transfer, transfer this number on this register, on this variable, to one of the columns in the mill. Um, and we could set an option to uh, either 
erase the number while you're copying it, or uh, keep it like there. Uh, that was one. And, and the last card you use were the operation cards. So I already mentioned the cards you used to operate on. That would be, uh, for, for starters, the, the basic arithmetic function. So multiplication, uh, addition, subtraction, division. Um, but there are also some other cards. And these cards are actually the most interesting. Um, there was one card to shift the numbers in a column. So you could solve it. It's like a bit of like bit shifting. So why would you need that? When we talked about the logarithmic table, I actually looked up not the number I entered, but the number um, shifted a few decimal places. Um, but also, you already knew that you can use that to multiply by 10. And that's how it's used. So um, if you do, for example, multiplication, the difference, the difference engine uh, and also the analytic engine would take a number, um, multiply it by 10 by shifting it up, and then adding it to the next result, if you envision that. But these three different kinds of cards made it very hard to operate. There were three different reading mechanisms that fed these cards into the machine. Um, and Ada Lovelace wasn't very fond of that way. She actually envisioned a different way. And this is how she envisioned this computation. Um, she made a, a table, actually, of some sort, that would describe which cards you should have to enter. So if you take a look at the left-hand column, just, these are just the indices of the operations the machine will do. In the next column, there are the, the elementary operations that are used um, in the mill. And the next column, so th these are, will be the program cards. Uh, and the next column are the variables cards. Those transfer the information to and from uh, the mill and the variables. Uh, and the next actually is a, a shorthand for the operations he does. So, Ada Lovelace uh, improved upon the ideas Charles Babbage had. Uh, and I think that if you ask me, uh, is Ada Lovelace the first functional programmer? Uh, I would say yes. And the reason for that is, well, first of all, what functional programming is, is ill-defined. So, you can give it any definition you like. Well, not any. But... Um, she, she did do functional programming in the sense that she worked with functions. The program you just saw uh, calculated the Bernoulli numbers. Does anybody know what the Bernoulli numbers are? Well, but almost. So uh, the decision was that they're used in combinatorics. It's almost right. They're, they're, if you... The Bernoulli family was large, like there were seven Bernoulli mathematicians. So yes, one invented the combinatorics functions. This Bernoulli um, was actually more on the needed to produce a logarithmic table. So um, Andre told me, told us actually, that how do you calculate the logarithmic a function? Well, you can use a Taylor expansion. And the Taylor expansion is mumble jumble, but it's a means to create a polynomial that will match a given function on a given domain. Um, and these Bernoulli numbers crop up in the expansion of the Taylor function of the logarithm. So this is a program which tells you how to create the coefficients of the polynomial to calculate the logarithmic. So this is a step, uh, an exposition of how to use the, the, the analytic engine. Uh, and I love this did that. So is she a functional programmer? Yes, she's a functional programmer because she programmed with functions. But not only that, she is actually, she took the idea of Charles Babbage. She understood it, which is quite remarkable in the, in the age she lived. Uh, if, you have, if you want to feel how it is to live as a Victorian aged a woman, uh, or person for that matter, uh, you should read Pride and Prejudice, uh, which is a great book, I think. Um, if, you, if you don't really like classical literature, you can also read Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, uh, which is a, an adaption of this story, but it introduces zombies into it. So the story is quite the same, only the characters behave differently, uh, having a different intent, because they're zombies sometimes. Um, uh, but it tells the, the, the same story. Um, but you know that 
being a Victorian aged woman woman uh, is very hard. There are all sorts of um, confines you have to uh, fi yeah, fit in to, to be a proper Victorian woman. Um, and she, she punched through that glass ceiling uh, by talking with Charles Babbage, by taking his ideas, and taking them a step further even. Charles Babbage was a very down-to-earth man. He took ideas that were um, apparent in his age. He took the loom, which he didn't thought of. Uh, he took the punch card, which already was, was there. And really only what he did was, well, I can think up of a way to use that to make a table for navigation. That's a remarkable feat, don't, don't get me wrong. But the, it's something that was in the air at the moment. Everybody at that age could see that something was going to happen with the industrial revolution going. Um, so we only, we only capitalized on it. But what Ada Lovelace do, and I would recommend everybody to look, look into <coughs> her story and her work. Her, her work actually was translating a letter of an Italian engineer. Um, and she, she translated that into English. Um, but she made notes. And you can actually read a transcript of her work uh, online nowadays. And if you read through the letter, it's like a very verbose description of this machine. You can understand what's happening, um, but it's not a very good job. And then Anna Lovelace steps in with her notes, and it becomes crystal clear, at least for me. She was a mathematician, so she, she uses a bit of math, but, well, that's basic. Mathematics is not applied to computer science. Um, so, is Anna Lovelace a functional programmer? Yes, but in my opinion, she's more. She wrote to Charles Babbage that this machine that he envisioned could do a lot more than just uh, making tables. She envisioned that this machine could play music, um, even compose music, if there was a means of expressing it. Just like Alan Turing, before, uh, after her, said and asked questions about what could a machine do, uh, could machines think, Ada Lovelace, a century before Alan Turing, asked the same questions. So yes, in my opinion, Ada Lovelace is a functional programmer, but even more is the first computer scientist. Um, with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you. <laughs>